Good morning. If I may ask you to have a seat. Uh, my name is Raul Rosenthal. I'm privileged uh, to be for the next uh, two hours uh, that remain uh, the president of this wonderful society. And it is my distinguished honor to introduce to you today our 2016 Edward E. Mason Annual Lecturer. Our lecturer is uh, Professor Camilo Ricordi. As you can see, Camilo has several titles. Uh, he is a Stacy Joy Goodman Professor of Surgery, Distinguished Professor of Medicine, Professor of Biological Engineering and Microbiology and Immunology. He's also the director of the Diabetes Research Institute and director of the Cell Transplant Program at the University of Miami in Florida. Uh, Camilo holds so many titles, uh, including also the, the chief of the cell transplant program at the University of Miami, and he has collaborated in developing methods for large-scale production of human pancreatic islet cells. He led the team that performed the first series of successful clinical islet transplants to reverse diabetes. Recognized by his peers as an expert in human cell <clears throat> processing characterization and transplantation. Dr. Ricordi was president of the Cell Transplant Society and served on the FDA Biologic Response Modifiers Advisory Committee and on several NIH expert panels and strategic planning committees. He is currently serving as chairperson of the steering committee of the NIH, Islet Cell Transplant Consortium, which standardized cell manufacturing protocols in North America and Europe and completed the first multicenter FDA phase three trial of islet cell transplantation in the United States. Dr. Ricordi received numerous honors and awards and was also knighted by the President of the Republic of Italy. He is currently serving on the editorial boards of Cell R4 and Cell Transplantation. In 2013, Dr. Ricordi was appointed president of the RI Med Foundation by the Italian Prime Minister, and he also serves as founding chairman of the Cure Alliance and of the Diabetes Research Institute Federation. Scientific publications, 1,023. Citations, 32,900. He's an inventor. He has been awarded over 25 patents in his career. You can see him as a young fellow here when he started doing his research on cell transplantation. I have to say something that not many people know. Camilo developed the recorded chamber, and he's been already visited by the Nobel Academy. Uh, once pancreatic islet cell transplantation is going to become standard of care, probably we're going to see Camilo uh, big time in the news. Uh, as you can read here, the crime, diabetes freedom fighter with serial attempts to undermine multi-billion pharma market by developing a cure. Bail, support and funding for collaborative efforts to find the cure, the sentence. Life without parole, collaborating worldwide to find a cure, time served, 32 years in cure focused on research. This time, around this time last year in the month of November, there was uh, in the news uh, a, major, uh, a major catastrophe, one of our soldiers that got injured, uh, that went into Walter Reed, and you can see the headlines, American soldiers severely wounded in Afghanistan receive historic islet cell transplant. Diabetes Research Institute aids in unprecedented procedure on Thanksgiving, December 15, 2009. And you can see Dr. Ricordi at the bedside of this successful transplant uh, procedure. So uh, without any further delay, please uh, join me in giving a big round of applause to our distinguished professor today, Professor Camilo Ricordi. Let me help you with the... Okay. In eight seconds, it's going to change your presentation. So. Fantastic. Thank you, Raul, Mr. President. What an introduction. Wow, I was very uh, moved. Is, um, so that was practically my talk. Now, if there is any question... <laughs> It's actually uh, it's the first time I'm giving a non-surgical transplant, cell transplant talk, but it uh, has a little of a personal spin, so I hope you will forgive me if I want to address what I found is a real threat for our 
uh, environmental, nutritional envir environment in the United States and worldwide, the, what we call the perfect nutritional storm <clears throat> and its effect on obesity, chronic degenerative disease condition and longevity. So <clears throat> I'm uh, on the advisory board of Zone Lab and the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition Foundation, non-profit, but I don't have any stock, so I will not become wealthier after this talk. Is uh, the mission in our institute, I hope you will have a chance to visit in Miami, the Diabetes Research Institute, is to find a cure for diabetes, as Raoul mentioned. And uh, <clears throat> we say that uh, you cannot find a cure or a permanent cure without pre prevention. There is no cure without prevention. And I think it's a parallel with uh, bariatric surgery and uh, the world of surgery for obesity because uh, you are giving a new chance at life and setting the clock back to a, a normal weight or significantly decreased weight, but then you have to deal, if you don't treat the underlying condition that can lead to a recurrence of overweight, you may be back to square one. So this was, a, as, as Raoul mentioned, is a, important for me because I signed 30 years of the recorded chamber and this automated method, and we're, if you want to learn more, there, there is a wonderful uh, review a few years ago was published. Uh, it's an excellent sleeping material. If you, uh, if you have insomnia, I guarantee in 10 minutes you go to sleep like a baby with 400 references. But uh, it's been important also because now, 30 years later, we just completed the uh, phase 3 FDA trial, as it was mentioned, uh, manufacturing and harmonizing CGMP cell processing at different, eight different facilities in North America. And uh, if you take the issue of diabetes that just came out, we also were um, honored by the cover of, of diabetes this month uh, with this uh, trial and the method paper on the trial. So basically, this is the first license enabling trial of a cellular product for treatment of type 1 diabetes, and if it is approved by FDA, it may be the first uh, metabolically active complex cellular product approved by FDA. We're applying now for the biological license and hopefully insurance reimbursement for the most severe cases of diabetes. So in summary, this <coughs> demonstrated the trial was successful in the way that we met the primary endpoint in almost 90% of the subjects at one year. Hemoglobin A1C was 5.6 and 5.8 at two years, so uh, excellent metabolic results, uh, but still requires immunosuppression. So this is something that is limited to the most severe cases of type 1 diabetes where you can justify taking anti-rejection drugs uh, for life. We're working with the Federation of Centers Worldwide, here are some of them are over 25 now to try to <clears throat> uh, get the next quantum leap, which is transplantation without immunosuppression. And, uh, and we try to work through telescience platform technology that allow us to work together, like if we are in the same laboratory, even if we have a team in uh, Asia or in Europe or in South America or North America. And this is the Cure Alliance with this official journal that we recently to promote international collaborations while overcoming impediments and barriers to the development of cures, working collaboratively with, uh, <coughs> uh, with groups and with the regulatory institutions. And uh, we, we now just pass uh, a little over 50,000 supporters worldwide. So it's an organization that is growing that I hope you will consider also uh, joining. It's free for now. But now I'd like to switch to nutrition and to see from Italy to the United States my first personal encounter with the perfect nutritional storm. Not that I want to blame anyone besides myself, but <clears throat> I started moving from Italy where I was sort of, um, everything looked good during medical school. I had a, <laughs> I had a good life. This uh, was uh, Mick Jagger, wife Jerry Hall and her friend and uh, I even make the centerfold of Vogue magazine for the uh, Valentino collection during medical school. So uh, my grandmother said, uh, you know, you're, you're lucky because you're a record and you, you have these genes that you can eat anything you want and you will never gain a pound. So I felt very confident about this recommendation when I moved to the United States. <laughs> but... <laughs> 
So I kept eating my pizza with Thomas Tarzel in Pittsburgh. I had the pizza hut was right below the office, and we had transplant all over, cafeteria always open, chocolate chip cookies, and, uh, and not very well disciplined. And what can happen when you gain two and a half kilograms every year for 25 years is something that can be scary to some of you, but you're used, because then what you can do, if you're lucky, you can meet someone like uh, Dr. Rosenthal after intensive research. And it was at the time that um, my <coughs> Life term insurance told me, no, you, we cannot renew your insurance. I say, what do you mean? Like, it will be a little more expensive. He says, no, no, look at the chart. You, you don't exist in five years, so we cannot reinsure you. And um, so I had to say, find someone to uh, save my life. And so this person became very popular in my family, and now it's called Saint Rosenthal. <laughs> <laughs> So he gave me, with this strange procedure, removing all these ghrelin secreting cells and taking away appetite and weight, and brought me back a chance of uh, setting back the clock. But nevertheless, we have to be careful because we know you can go back with the same trend and regain slowly uh, the same weight that you lost, hopefully not. But here is the global problem. So we have 400 million people with diabetes, for 5 million deaths a year, one person die every sec seven seconds, and uh, <clears throat> all the correlated uh, uh, challenges with the disease and associated condition and complication. So if you see overall cardiovascular diabetes, the estimate uh, are amazing growth we're facing with an epidemic, and uh, at the same time you have this paradox that, well, you have two and over 2 billion people obese and overweight, you have 800 million that suffer from hunger and malnutrition. And uh, if you look at life expectancy, you say, well, why do you complain? Life expectancy has increased dramatically from 1915, 45 years to 80 years. But if you look what is the quality of this life and is life in the presence of chronic degenerative disease condition that can also cost now in the United States over two and a half trillion a year and 20% of the GDP. So it's, a, it's not a healthy lifespan that we try to thrive for. And if, if you see as you increase also lifespan, uh, neurodegenerative disease condition like Alzheimer are becoming almost uh, uh, unbearable to support both uh, for the patients and financially. So the aging population worldwide is uh, increasing. As in blue, the countries with over 20% over 65 years of age. And uh, if you look now, over 90% on the individual greater than 65 years of age have at least one chronic disease, and 75% or more have at least two comorbidities. And uh, so these are the dollar spends on, Al on Alzheimer and the projection for the total number of individuals that will more than double by 2050. And what we are aiming, what we hope to do, like with anti-inflammatory nutrition or preventive strategies, is to try to aim for the so-called uh, square curve of life expectancy, of healthy lifespan, so that you, in theory you arrive at around 130, 140 years of age, you run your marathon, then you go to sleep and you don't wake up. That would be the perfect... Uh, so, uh, but now instead we are we are decreasing the healthy lifespan and then having this longer period that is longer and longer because we are able to keep people alive more effectively. So even if you cure diabetes, you will not solve some of these uh, uh, multiple chronic conditions because then you will have dementia and <coughs> cardiovascular disease it will just extend the period of ill health. So the impact is, in, is amazing on how if you can prolong just uh, to delay aging would have the largest impact on the number of healthy older adults and a, a tremendous impact on, uh, on health care expenditures. So this is uh, already how much do we spend as far as GDP in the United States where we have this record but many other countries are increasing progressively. So is, uh, <clears throat> is this issue, like is, uh, we are definitely eating too much in the United States, especially uh, we have now, well, we have 500 million people living in hunger and malnutrition in, in Asia. 
Now we have uh, uh, 6.3 million children less than five years dying <coughs> uh, of this death linked to malnutrition. And then we have this uh, paradox on the other side, the 2.1 billion obese and uh, 33 million deaths annually from disease linked to excess of food. So just uh, not to talk about the food waste, that we, we waste one third of the food, but we consume so much more than needed that we will need, uh, by 2030, we would need three planet Earth to support a diet like the one that we, as average, are, is consuming in this country. So these are the global paradoxes that we are facing on food and nutrition. You know, the hunger versus obesity, the fact that we world grain production goes more than 50% doesn't go to feed humans, but uh, to feed like uh, animal fo uh, feeding or biofuels now, and the issue of food waste that uh, is four times what it would take to feed the over 800 million people who are hungry and malnourished. So what is the role of inflammation in this perfect nutritional storm in all this? Uh, is uh, what time <coughs> cover defines as the secret killer is a, is a low-level inflammation that you have in your blood that is linked to diet. You know, we're all used to inflammatory response to microbial in, in, invasions, bacterial, viral infection, injuries, but diet is uh, maybe even more important because you don't feel it. If you don't measure it, you don't feel it. And uh, in inflammation, you generally have an initiating event, and then <coughs> you have a pro-inflammatory initiation response, and then an anti-inflammatory resolution response. And then if you feel it, you can intervene and try to treat it effectively uh, during the acute phase. But if you don't feel it, and uh, if you don't promote resolution, and blocking resolution, it becomes a chronic process that can lead to organ failure and chronic degenerative disease condition. So the dietary causes that are behind this global increase in uh, cellular <coughs> silent inflammation are basically four. In the last three decades, we have increased dramatically the level of omega-6 fatty acids that consume, increased the use of refined carbohydrates, decrease omega-3 that are protective, as well as polyphenols and antioxidants in our diet. And what happened is that it's called a perfect nutritional storm because these are negative effects that can be synergistic. For example, if you take refined vegetable oils that are high in linoleic acid, potentially it's not that bad by itself. But now when you combine those with a high glycemic index uh, food uh, product, uh, become, uh, start triggering through the insulin secretion in response to the high glycemic index food, you activate the saturase enzyme that trigger the metabolism of linoleic acid to arachidonic acid. And this is a highly pro-inflammatory molecule. So to make it simple, like omega-6 fatty acids in, from the diet are activated by insulin, inhib inhibited by omega-3, but if they increase, they lead to arachidonic acid and cellular inflammation. Here is a schematic of a cell uh, made simple, but the major activation is through the nf kappa -B system and then uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, produce like IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. So basically, if you, the dietary control of this inflammatory diet-induced inflammation is if you increase, <coughs> if you decrease the omega-3 in the diet and increase the omega-6, you have uh, more inflammation. And the omega-3 are uh, important because they not only are anti-inflammatory, but over a certain uh, level in the blood, they become pro-resoleomic, activate the resoleomic pathways and resolvings that can help uh, heal or uh, tissue damage. And so it's a double effect that is positive, not just anti-inflammatory. So if you want to read more about this, um, uh, factors, this anti-inflammatory nutrition as a pharmacological approach to treat obesity. And the reason I present it is because uh, it could be something that is considered in combination with bariatric surgery, because uh, once you go back to the ideal weight, our challenge is how we pre prevent in the next 10, 20 years a return to overweight. But it also has a, an important implication also on um, on aging in general, because as you increase inflammation, you increase 
the requirement for progenitor endothelial cells and other progenitor cells to go repair constantly this uh, sub-threshold level inflammation that you don't feel, you don't detect, but they have to repair. So the potential to repair tissue can exhaust earlier in life. So this uh, uh, is a recent paper by Barry Sears, but this is an interesting table. It's uh, provocative because Japanese people have the longest healthy lifespan on Earth. Uh, and American has also long, but not as healthy. But if you look at parameters like cholesterol is similar, LDL similar. In Japan, there are even much more smokers than Americans, but the level of inflammation as measured by the arachidonic acid over EPA ratio, look, in the Japanese population is less than 3, 11 in Americans, and the mortality <coughs> uh, is like 160 versus 46. So how you measure this cellular inflammation in the blood that is diet-related is not C-reactive protein, is not very specific because it could be downstream and there is no indication uh, related to the diet necessarily, but the arachidonic acid over EPA is a good surrogate about omega-6 over omega-3 ratio, and you should aim to have less than two. Uh, is thought that if you go less than one, you may have problems with the increased uh, possibility of bleeding, but is a very rare to go below one is like a very, very tough. And um, ideally, you will keep it between one and three, and then start treating if you, if you are above. So what we suggest, and now everyone in, in my institute, uh, at the beginning they thought I was crazy, and then now after the new papers are coming out, everybody is asking me where to get some uh, omega-3, and, and uh, both faculty and staff and students. But as you see, are pretty strong, heavy levels, and the problem to get uh, study funded uh, with this hypothesis is that there is no billion dollar molecule, there is no big market, it's, uh, you can buy it um, everywhere, you, you just uh, have to be careful to buy the very highly purified one, because if you go uh, high dose, if you take only one pill that doesn't do anything uh, from CVS or Walgreen Omega-3, uh, is okay as far as toxicity, but if you take 10 pills or 8 or 12 for the liquid form concentrated, you better make sure that it's purified and doesn't have heavy metal contaminants like you can find in fish. So these are some uh, studies on type 1 diabetes, early studies that were uh, performed, uh, omega-3 fatty acid in clinical studies. They have been inconclusive. Basically, they were using only 1.7 grams. Uh, compared to the 8 to 12 grams that we use uh, uh, nowadays. And uh, <clears throat> so it's, it's also important to uh, consider the ratio between EPA and DHA in, in this uh, composition. And there are studies that are uh, interesting in, the, in this transgenic mice that show definitely that the omega-3 fatty acid can prevent uh, diabetes induction in this preclinical model system. So. Initial studies on omega-3 and cytokines have been published many years ago by Charles Dinarello and his uh, colleagues, and they showed that uh, there was a very good effect on, <coughs> on reduction of uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and that the effect remains also a few weeks after you discontinue omega-3 assumption, but then goes back to baseline if you, don't, if you go back to the same ratio of omega-6 over omega-3. And this is a study that we published very recently that is now uh, generating a lot of interest for intervention in type 1 diabetes and autoimmunity in general. So we started giving a combination of uh, high-dose omega-3 and high-dose vitamin D, colecalciferol, in this 14-year-old uh, um, kid that was newly diagnosed. And, uh, <clears throat> and now you can measure this ratio, so you can target the dose to the ratio that you want to achieve in the bloodstream. So we started from 6 gram a day, and we went to 12 gram a day. But after one year, if you see the stimulated C-peptide increase from the baseline one year before. So now we just got approval to do two randomized prospective trials in diabetes, both at the onset and uh, in established diabetes, to see if these anti-inflammatory strategies can be helpful to delay or stop disease progression. Because in a way, the first time we discussed this, it, 
it seems impossible. Like, how can you reverse or block out immunity with an anti-inflammatory strategy? But if you look data on vitamin D3 uh, at high doses, stimulate regulatory T cells and stimulate uh, regulatory dendritic cells in in vivo expansion models and also mesenchymal stromal cells in uh, expansion models in in vitro. So now you will see more and more integration of anti-inflammatory strategies with cellular therapies like TREX, dendritic cells, tolerogenic, MS, mesenchymal stromal cells infusion to reverse and treat autoimmune conditions. But what surprised us is this was supposed to be the first trial to set the base for then a randomized trial between anti-inflammatory alone that doesn't work and the cell therapy that would work and instead is working by itself and is, is fitting with the fact that before autoimmunity, we, when we went to medical school, we thought diabetes type 1 is a disease where the immune system gets crazy, selectively attack the beta cells. But now instead, <coughs> we know that there is a period of inflammation that can vary months to year before there is actually autoimmunity. And when you take biopsy from the pancreas, you still find islets that are subject to an inflammatory attack, so they shut down functionally, but eventually if you remove the inflammation, they can recover or they could recover. And that is the hypothesis that will be tested. There are also positive effects in other autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And if you're interested in the subject, this is a paper that just came out, but is really uh, interesting because uh, shows all these factors and review all the literature and the data is was published in Open Heart uh, Journal on the importance of a balanced omega-6, omega-3 and uh, underlines all the changes that we had in the food chain and in our nutrition over the centuries, practically looking on how typical Western diets now provides a ratio omega-6, omega-3 around 16. Uh, and we used to be uh, in the Paleolithic era, less than one, uh, in Greek, Greece, one to two. Current USA, over 16. UK, Northern Europe, 15. Japan, four. And then look at India, like rural, they're doing pretty well, but urban uh, situation, you, you go even twice as much as uh, United States. And in this countries where you see this huge increase in epidemics, also of obesity and uh, diabetes. So you may say, well, we were living much less in this era than now, so maybe it's a good thing to have a higher issue, but the, the whole issue is, is how to prolong healthy lifespan and prevent this chronic degenerative disease condition. And here you can see the issue of the vegetable refined oils, how some of this linoleic acid, the precursor of arachidonic acid, is, can be over 70% in sunflower, is in walnut oil, in corn oil, safflower oil, while extra virgin olive oil and Mediterranean diet look pretty good, are actually very good for your health. And if you see, this is a table like summarizing the opposing effect of omega-6 and omega-3 on adipose cell tissue, white adipose tissue, brown adipose tissue, and are all uh, very interesting and uh, very well referenced study showing uh, all of the above uh, variables, including telomeres and longevity. So Western diet uh, uh, and the role of uh, arachidonic acid in adipose cell differentiation, proliferation, and decreasing browning of white adipose tissue we will need further research to address that. But this I would want to leave you at the end uh, of my talk with these two animation that gives you summarizing what can happen while you don't feel anything and you feel no pain. So here is a guy with a typical inflammatory diet, maybe a young football player or um, just a, a regular kid that is the expression of health and strength. And uh, here maybe is your... Um, nerd, uh, vegan, computer-based, uh, thin, that doesn't, but by the age, by age um, 40, by age 40, uh, this guy, the inflammatory diet, already you don't feel it, you don't have any pain, but you shorten already by two-thirds your healthy lifespan potential compared to the other kid. And then in the next phase of your life, by age 70, your healthy lifespan potential or ability of progenitor cells to 
repaired tissues, like even arteriosclerosis was thought was a disease of the position of the plaque, but as a disease instead of failure of repair mechanism. So once you exhaust the potential of your endo endothelial progenitor cells, they cannot repair anymore, while the guy with an anti-inflammatory diet maybe still have over one-third lifespan potential at age 70. So this is um, some of the effect. Now there are papers you probably saw also metformin effect on longevity and telomere length, Mediterranean diet and telomere length, so that you, I'm sure you will hear many more studies appearing in the, in, in the next few several months, and I'm fully aware that prolonging healthy lifespan is just one of the burning issues for our planet, and uh, there are many others we will have to deal uh, during the next four years of presidency in the United States and worldwide. But I, I'd like to thank my collaborators in the United States and Italy, and especially Dr. Rosenthal for giving me the opportunity to continue to work on these issues instead of disappearing as one statistic. I thank the DRI Federation collaborator and the Cure Alliance Worldwide, and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Don't go away. Don't go away. Well, I think we're all really so, so impressed with your presentation. Not a surprise to me. I didn't know that you were so funny. He's really funny. Um, so, Camilo, uh, let me give you this small plaque, ASMBS. Be it known, the Society hereby recognizes and honors Camilo Ricordi, MD, Edward E. Mason Founders Lecture, November 3rd, 2016. Thank you so, so much for coming to see us and to give us this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.